As of Generation 8, Pokémon's gained a bit of a reputation for temporarily removing pre-existing Pokémon from their games, resulting in each game's Pokédex to look drastically different from the previous. This also results in competitive formats having to deal with threats that are available within each game. And while I do miss Minior specifically, I actually don't really mind this change as a competitive player. That being said, there are some Pokémon that are not only unavailable outside of the region, but are just stuck in their generation or game of origin forever. Today we're going to be discussing deleted Pokémon. But that's just a snazzy title. What I really mean are Pokémon that you can't use anymore because they're just never going to be available outside of their gen. For this video, we'll be excluding any Dynamax forms and Megas because there's just a lot of them and their removal has more to do with their generation's gimmick not being present in future games and less to do with them not being moved up a generation. I will be discussing the primal forms of Groudon and Kyogre though because they're technically not Megas and they kind of are but I, I just want to talk about them. If you enjoyed this video at any point in time, do me a favor, leave a like on it, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications because we are on our way to 100,000 subscribers. Anyways, let's get into this, and we'll start chronologically with Spiky-Eared Pichu. Spiky-Eared Pichu isn't the most relevant competitive Pokemon because, well, it, it's, it's a Pichu. But it's an early example of a Pokemon that can't leave its home game. Probably for no other reason than they didn't really expect anyone to complain, but clearly they don't know Pokemon fans. This little guy is an event from Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver that the player could obtain via an event that involved interacting with the shrine in the Ilex Forest with a shiny event Pichu. It had its own sprite and was very clearly different visually from a regular Pichu due to its, well, spiky ear. But beyond that, it wasn't really all that special. It was based off of a spiky-eared Pichu that appeared in a lot of Pokemon media, including a movie and the manga, but it's forever stuck in Generation 4 as it's not able to be transferred up to Gen 5 and thus the entire rest of the franchise. Okay, now that we got the baby Pokemon out of the way, let's get started on some real heavy hitters. Our next example is Gen 6 with... Okay, well, it's not actually a heavy hitter, it's, it's, it's another Pikachu form. I don't hear a lot of people discussing this one nowadays, but it was pretty cool for its time. The cosplay Pikachu was a special Pikachu given to players of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire that was meant to be used within the game's contests. This Pikachu had a unique trait in its tail having a distinct heart-shaped black mark on it, not to be confused with the female Pikachu's sort of heart-shaped tail. This thing was pretty interesting, as it not only had this one difference in its model, but it also had five costumes that it could don and granted access to special moves that Pikachu wouldn't normally be able to learn. The Rockstar Pikachu would gain access to Meteor Mash, Bell Pikachu would gain access to Icicle Crash, Popstar Pikachu would gain access to Draining Kiss, PhD Pikachu, very smart, would gain access to Electric Terrain, and Pikachu Libre gained access to Flying Press and Pokémon Tournament. So this Pokémon still exists, but only if Pokémon Tournament actually gets a true sequel. I feel your pain, Pokémon fans. Anyways, this is a pretty neat little exclusive to Oris that helped the game have its own unique identity from the originals, but this little rat was far from the most relevant Pokémon in the games that you can't use anymore. While Primal Groudon and Kyogre were granted access to the Alola region in Generation 7, due to their crimes they're no longer available as of Generation 8. These things were menaces and competitive, practically defining the restricted format metagames of both Gen 6 and Gen 7, and this was really no surprise. Let's start with Primal Groudon. Where a wimpy regular Groudon was only an S tier Pokemon, a Primal Groudon was able to challenge God himself with its massive stat buffs, but not actually because Arceus has never been VGC legal. Point is, this thing not only gained access to its long awaited fire typing upon holding the red orb, but it also got a buffed version of Drought called Desolate Land. This ability set up Sun as long as Groudon was active on the field. This improved Sun was not only perpetually up as long as the other Omega Alpha Super Grande Nacho Weather ability didn't activate, but it fizzled out all water moves, meaning Primal Groudon bypassed its biggest weakness and could easily 1v1 a Kyogre. Getting Sun set up after Kyogre was so crucial to this thing's survival that people even started running level 49 Groudons to ensure the Sun went up after Kyogre's weather ability. And even crazier than that, there was a brief period that Golduck was used to counter it since its ability Cloud9 allowed it to bypass the Desolate Land. As a side note, I actually do have videos on both of these fun times in VGC that you can check out after you watch this one. But yeah, this dude defined Generation 6, and when you pair it with a Xerneas, you had a synergistic combo that went positive into just about everything, except... Primal Kyogre was the Ying to Groudon's Yang, the Alpha to its Omega, and the Rain to its Parade. They couldn't just let Groudon walk all over Kyogre, so Primal Kyogre gained massive stat buffs and an improved Drizzle in Primordial Sea. This worked the exact same as Desert Land, but it set up rain and fizzled out fire moves instead. It was like a paradise for Ferrothorns. 
Primal Kyogre was just as relevant as Primal Groudon, and their matchups were 100% dependent on which player could better position their Pokemon on the field. Kyogre was so invested in making sure it could remove Groudon from play that it was really common to pair it with Rayquaza or Mega Gengar. And yeah, I know it's also pronounced Rayquaza. I I'm not gonna, I don't care. Look, argue in the comments about it, Rayquaza. All right, with the former being able to disable all weathers, allowing for Kyogre to hit Groudon with a water move, and the latter being able to prevent Groudon from saving itself from water moves by switching out. This combination of Pokemon actually won the World Championships in 2016 on Wolf Glick's Super Pivot Heavy Ray Ogre team. It even included an eject button hit on top to ensure that nothing would ever prevent Kyogre or Rayquaza from hitting the field at the right time. The Primal Pokemon dominated Gen 6 and 7 restricted formats, and I seriously do not miss them. You practically had to run one of these to have success in these formats. Our next victim of Annihilation comes from Generation 7, and while it was never VGC legal, I'll do my best to describe how good it was in Smogon Singles, where it actually was legal. Actually, nah, I'll just have Chimpak do this. Ash Greninja is what you get when you have the power of Arceus and anime on your side. Form changes like Primal Kyogre and Groudon require an item, but Greninja got that frog in him, so it just needs a KO to transform. It was one of the strongest Pokemon in the Sun and Moon metagame, rivaling the power of Mega Evolution, as it was always top 5 in usage and hovered around top 3 after all the dust settled with the bands of Zygarde and Naga Nadel. It absolutely crushed offensive teams with its overwhelming speed and power, and if something was faster, it had access to its Water Shuriken attack, a priority move which always always hit 3 times and was boosted to 20 power in his new form. He could support his team with lead spikes. A true trend center as Hisu and Samurott, another water dark starter, would copy this strategy a few years later. Dark Pulse and Hydro Pump were his main attacks and were only resisted by a few Pokemon in the metagame, and because it was often paired with Pelipper's Rain, a resistant Hydro Pump could still 2 hit KO those Pokemon despite it resisting them. Greninja was a major reason why there were so many Pokemon that ran Assault Vest and Smog on OU, and there's something they all have in common. Azumarill, Tapu Bulu, Magirna, and Tangrowth were the most common users of Assault Vest, and they all happened to resist one of Greninja's stab attacks, which just goes to show how menacing it truly was. Greninja was not in Generation 8 due to the budget cuts Chairman Rose had to make to maximize his profits, and in Generation 9, Battle Bond was reworked to be a one-time boost to Greninja's offensive stats once it got a KO. Hey, it's me again, the VGC guy. So anyways, this one really hurts me. I don't know if I've mentioned this in the channel, but my undergrad research had to do with optical tweezing, so I find light in general super cool, and I really love Necrozma. When you take a look at Necrozma's stats, you realize how underwhelming of a Pokemon it is. Yeah, it can fuse with Lunala or Solgaleo to become much stronger, but it's just not Necrozma, you know? It's, it's like a fusion of Solgaleo and Lunala, and it looks more like them than the Pokemon you started out with. Base Necrozma was the only version of it in Pokemon Sun and Moon, but in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, you were able to fuse it with Lunala or Solgaleo to make Necrozma Dusk Mane or Dawn Wings. And then Game Freak also introduced Ultra Necrozmium Z. Probably the stupidest name for an item ever, but it was necessary to equip this onto Necrozma to Ultra Burst it. This was effectively if a Z-move and a Mega had a kid, a fused Necrozma would turn into Ultra Necrozma, a psychic dragon type with insane stats and an ability that was effectively a built-in expert belt. Once you Ultra Burst, Ultra Necrozma could use its item with a stupid name to use a move with a really, really cool name. Light That Burns the Sky was this thing's exclusive 200 base power psychic Z-move. In VGC, you'd see this thing paired with Tapu Lele to send this move's power to a ridiculous 300 after psychic terrain. It could effectively one-shot whatever it wanted, and it was a huge threat in the metagame. Unfortunately, as of Generation 8, you can no longer gain access to Ultra Necrozma, meaning that it not only was constrained to a single generation, but a single pair of games within that generation since it wasn't available in the original Sun and Moon. Necrozma is quite literally a shell of its former self, and all I want is for this dude to come back in some way, shape, or form. The last Pokemon we're going to cover today are the partner Pokemon from Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. These Pokemon were really something special as to allow for the player to make use of their partner Pikachu or Eevee effectively throughout the whole game. They had to make some minor improvements to their stats and give them some absolutely busted moves to make them viable, but they made it work. These dudes couldn't evolve or hold items, so they went as far as to give the partner Pikachu a whopping 120 speed. That's faster than Raichu. Pikachu was also granted access to the moves Splishy Splash and Zippy Zap. No, really, those those were the names of the moves. It's, it's really funny. Splishy Splash was basically a water-type Thunderbolt. It was 90 base power and had the 30% chance to paralyze the target, just like Thunderbolt, basically just allowing for Pikachu to deal with opposing ground-type Pokemon more easily. 
Zippy's app, on the other hand, was utterly busted. This was a priority electric move with 80 base power that would also increase Pikachu's evasion by one stage each time. Hi, Ed here. What Marker said was technically correct. That is what Zippy Zap is currently coded to do in Gen 8. However, it was never able to be used in that generation. What it was coded to do in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee was to be a base 50 priority move that always crits. So instead of being a better electric type E speed, it was just a mini Urshifu. Also with priority. Thought I would leave a bit of a correction. Thumbs up. It would be utterly broken in competitive if it had access to it. Moving on to Eevee. <laughs> The partner Eevee had each of its stats increased by 20 points, except for its HP stat which was increased by 10, allowing for it to survive hits more easily and deal slightly better damage. But that's not what made it viable. Eevee had a ton of exclusive moves, so we gotta do sort of a lightning round here. Alright? Batty Bad was a dark type move that also set up Reflect, Bouncy Bubble was a water type move that also recovered 50% of the damage dealt, Buzzy Buzz was Nuzzle but stronger, Breezy Frost was 100 base power Haze, Glitzy Glow was a psychic type attack that also set up Light Screen, Sappy Seed was a 100 base power Leech Seed, Sizzly Slide was stronger fire type Nuzzle that burned, broken by the way, and Sparkly Swirl was a 120 base power fairy move that also healed the entire party of status conditions. Neither these Pokemon could leave Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, so we were saved the trouble of random Eevees being ran on teams to spread chaos in VGC matches. Like, it wouldn't actually be broken because it's still just an Eevee, but you get my point. Smeargle would learn all of these moves. But that's all the Pokemon that are, you know, probably never coming back. Let me know what you think about this video in the comment section down below, and be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed, and subscribe for more competitive Pokemon content. It's support from viewers like you that allow me to make these videos, so consider supporting me on Patreon. All of these beautiful people did already, so if you want to see your name up here, be sure to check that out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.